You probably heard of the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989 in Beijing, or Tiananmen Square massacre is more likely the name that's referred to you. The story is very simple. In the spring of 1989, Chinese college students went on the streets to protest, and eventually they gathered at Tiananmen Square. But the Chinese government, being an authoritarian government who doesn't like protests, just ordered the troop and shoot them at the square. Thousands of people, or even tens of thousands of people, died. The number is unknown to this day. But is this really true? If so, where are the sources that support this claim? And if this is the truth, why there are still many debates and mystery regarding the event? And if this is not true, what is the truth? As someone who was born in China just a few years after the protest and later moved to the United States, I've heard a lot of information about this event, and oftentimes they are contradictory. The desire for truth drives me to do my own research. I gotta say, it's a very emotional journey. I want to share this journey with you because I think you love truth as much as I do. I'm so sick of people being manipulated because of somebody's political interests. I'm so sick of people being denied freedom of truth in the name of freedom of speech. This is a video about the truth. If you've been getting your information from Western mainstream media or Western politicians, they've done a fantastic job in discrediting the Chinese government, so that you don't even want to listen to the story from the Chinese government because you automatically think they are making something up or they are covering something up, and that is fine. Turns out, for this specific case, we don't even need a story from the Chinese government to tell the truth. I'll be walking you through a lot of the resources and the information, all from the West, and that should be enough for us to see what happened. After that, I will share with you the story from the Chinese government and see how far their story is from the truth. You may not know that they had a story because the Western media constantly tell you that they try to erase the history and there was never a story, but there is one. It's just you may never heard of it. In order to find the truth of the event, the best resource I've found so far is a three-hour-long documentary called *The Gate of Heavenly Peace*, which is the literal translation of Tiananmen. The film was founded by the National Endowment of Humanities, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. It was produced and directed by two American filmmakers, Carver Hinton and Richard Gordon. So this is all American funding and all American production. On top of that, all the people they interview in this film are either participants in the protests or supporters of the protests, which make them essentially anti-Chinese government. What's so special about the film is that it has a very extensive interview of the people who were directly involved in the protests. And this offers us a lot of valuable first-hand information of their account of the event and their opinions of the event. The narrative of this film is organized through a chronological order, which makes it much easier to follow the development of the event. I'll walk you through the documentary, comment on some of the highlight moments, while throw some other information and resources in the mix. Be mindful of the hidden agenda of this film, like I mentioned before. And I will try to point them out as much as possible through my comments. All the resources I mention in the video will be linked down below, and I highly suggest you to check them out for yourself. Before I dive into the documentary, I want to establish a concept that there are four different groups of people in this movement. The first group is the Chinese government. The second group are the students. Five of them are interviewed in this documentary, and I wanted to pay special attention to three of them: Wang Dan, Wu Kaixi, and Chai Ling. The third group is intellectuals. As we move deeper in the story, we'll see what part they play in this movement. The last group is workers and civilians. The film does a okay introduction about the political context and the history at the moment. It briefly mentions things like the Cultural Revolution and the heritage of Mao.、Uh, for the sake of this video, I think you can just follow along with the、um, history introduction in the film. We don't need to discuss further about that. 
On the night of June 3, 1989, tanks and armored vehicles of the People's Liberation Army moved into Beijing and put an end to seven weeks of peaceful protest. The Western media always paint the protest as peaceful, harmless protest. As we move further in the story, we'll see if that statement is true or not. Events do not deliver their meanings to us. They are always interpreted. I can agree with that. Let's look at the interpretations. He disappeared into the crowd afterwards, and no one knows where he is now. Even though they don't show you right here, but she said it, he disappeared in the crowd. Uh, I have other footages to show you about the exact footage of he dra was dragged into the crowds by bystanders and some other things regarding the tank man after I go through this film. But for the millions who saw this scene all over the world, its meaning was clear. Here was human hope and courage challenging the remorseless machinery of state power. The Chinese government interpreted this scene just as simply, but differently. Okay, there are a few things I want to say here. In case you don't know what that news program is, that is the most important news program in China. It roughly translates to news collections of the day. It starts at 7 p.m. every single day, and it confirms one thing, which is all the talks in the West that the image of the tank man was never shown in China was wrong. It was shown at the time through the most watched news program of the country. So many people who watched the news program back then, they definitely know the image. It's being censored now, but uh, I'll talk about the censorship after we go through the whole event. The second thing I want to say is look at these two interpretations. The one that you've heard a thousand times from the West and the one you just heard from China. If you can disregard all the bias, which one do you think make more sense? This guy was blocking the tank for quite some time and it was clear the tank was trying to go around him so it won't hurt him and then he climbed on top of the tank. This took a very long time. I just wanted you to put this into perspective. Imagine in the United States, forget about tanks and military vehicles. If you try and stop a operating police car, what's going to happen to you? So which one of these two interpretations make more sense to you? Mao had the personality of a romantic poet. Deng's is that of a pragmatist. He's not a puritanical theoretician or an idealist. He's different from Mao in that he knows that when people are hungry, they need to eat. They can't live on poetry. I don't agree with many things she said, but I can agree with this comment. More than anything else, workers complained of corruption. Many people think the foundation of these protests are about corruption. I think that's true. There was corruption in the government at the time. But I also think the more radical reason for this protest is an unavoidable result from Deng's economic reform. The official account is not introducing capitalism. And even till this day, many scholars around the world agree with that official account in a way that Deng's reform was introducing market economy without capitalism. So you may wonder how does that work? What I can tell you is that unlike Western capitalist countries, big capitals in China does not translate into political power. In other words, capital does not control politics. Deng's economic reform was to let some people get rich first, and then these rich people would help the rest get rich too. So in 1989, after 10 years of the economic reform, people are seeing some of the very first people start to get rich. And this really translates into inequality in real life, at least from a psychological level. When people were equally poor, you can still be pretty happy. 
But when you stay poor and somebody gets rich, that's when things are gonna be hard for many people. With Deng's economic reform, it doesn't matter who gets rich first because the rest, the majority of the people, will feel that sense of inequality. It's just very unfortunate that many of the people who got rich first have ties with the government, and that's where this protest really find its foundation. We thought commemorating one man was not going to help China. To ensure our nation's positive development, we have to start transforming the political system. We wanted to use this opportunity to put forth our political demands. I find it very naive for some 20-year-old to not only criticize the current policies of government, but also went on to say that somehow he knows or they know what's the best policy for the country and for the people. I think that statement itself is just a proof of how immature and how ignorant they actually were at the time. Even in the United States, to run for president, you have to meet a age threshold, which is 35 years and above. And there's a good reason for that. The second thing I want to say is that he is sort of implying that China refused to do reforms, which is totally not true, because at this point in 1989. China has been going dramatic、uh, reforms for ten years, and from what we know happened after that, in the past few decades, China is probably one of the only countries in the world that are constantly putting out dramatic new reforms in a very careful manner that really benefits the country as well as the people. I agree. This would probably be what many people join the protests in the beginning, and this is something that they want to see happening. And I just want to briefly touch on, you know, a few concepts of students, intellectuals, workers, and the people. Because over the documentary, if we look at what they say,、uh, we can see there is a kind of complicated, contradictory narrative between these concepts. So a little bit of historical background was that. Before the establishment of People's Republic of China, most Chinese people, I remember, eighty-five percent, were illiterate. These people live in poverty, have no education,、um, and it wasn't until the founding of the PRC that more people started to have access to education. The government did a lot of work and investment in education. In especially promoting education, as it believes that education will be the future of the country, and as a result, college students have long been thought of as the precious babies of China or the future of China. I cannot agree more with the government's stance on promoting higher education, but as a matter of fact, this also nurtures this level of arrogance among college students. Many of them consider themselves superior than the general public or the people. Many students consider themselves to be the future intellectuals, which is a concept that's even more superior, that is even more detached from the people. Throughout this documentary, we can see the inconsistency of how students identify themselves. Sometimes they think of themselves as representative of the people; other times they look down upon people. At Xinhua Man, the entrance to the old palace compound. Where China's top leaders live and work, the students waited for an answer. This is only the second day of the protest, and the students already want to break into what is the Chinese equivalent of the White House. They didn't go there to just hold signs and chant slogans. They actually wanted to. Break through the human barricade from the police and break in, and the fact that nobody was hurt or arrested is something that's unthinkable in the West. Can you imagine a group of people trying to break in the White House and nobody was arrested or hurt? This is not a peaceful protest, and it's only on day two. <laughs>
，在这个时候，他们出动了近千名军警，野蛮的冲击我们的队伍，野蛮的殴打我们的学生，还有北京市的其他各界的朋友，打伤人数可以说不计其数，而且他们对我们的女同学进行了猥亵、侮辱。Poor Kai Xi. This is a very important figure if you want to understand what happened throughout the entire protest. So he was on the square reporting this April twentieth atrocity. I would almost believe him if he didn't mention the last part. And there's a little off in the English translation because what he was saying in Chinese was that they sent out policemen to intentionally sexually assault the female students. It's not only just insane to claim that the government would send out police to sexually harass female students as a part of their mission, but knowing that there would be cameras around and in such a chaotic scene that the police somehow has to single out female students and then harass them in daylight in public, there's no way this story is true, and he seems to be the only one that claims it. On the night of April 19th, a new student union was formed at Beijing University. Seven people volunteered to be on the organizing committee. They became the leaders because they were courageous enough to step forward. There were no formal elections. Later, the committee made many efforts to organize elections, but because we constantly faced new crises. We couldn't do what we'd originally intended. This is one of the biggest ironies of the entire movement: that these students claim to fight for democracy for China, fighting for democracy for over a billion people, yet they cannot hold elections to elect their own leaders. And the students seem to be fine with it. The students had brought their petition and demanded that Li Peng, the prime minister, come out to accept it himself. When we saw our classmates kneeling there, holding the petition with raised arms, everyone cried. In it were our suggestions to the government, but we had to hand it in kneeling down. No one paid any attention. No one came forward to accept it. Now this is just absurd. Not only has there always been legit ways to submit suggestions for the government, but what the hell is this? Is this really about the suggestions, or is this more for publicity and drama? So they show up in front of the great hall of people uninvited, and they think that the prime minister has to personally come out and accept their petition. So if some people kneeling down with a petition in front of the White House. The president of the United States has to come out, and also, if you listen carefully, the students think that it's already a compromise for them to personally come to the Great Hall to submit their petition, meaning that in an ideal world, they think the government should actively beg for them for advice. This goes back to my point to just show how ignorant and how arrogant they were. I'm not speaking in favor of the Chinese government. I'm just speaking out about the insanity of this drama. No government in the world is going to behave like the way they expect the Chinese government to do. Dong Luan, turmoil, upheaval, chaos. A People's Daily editorial denounced the demonstrations. We must unequivocally oppose Dong Luan. The headline read. Such an editorial appearing in the official Communist Party media amounted to a charge of criminal conspiracy. The editorial of People's Daily shows the official attitude from the Chinese Communist Party, and、um, given the fact that this was just ten something years after the Cultural Revolution, I understand the concern people had back then, and this editorial definitely has a lot of weight on them. But on the other hand, to just recap, this is just a few days in the protests. And they try to break in the Chinese equivalent of the White House for two days consecutively, and they stage this crazy drama in front of the Great Hall, which is the Chinese equivalent of the U.S. Capitol. And so, to define the whole thing as an upheaval and turmoil, you could argue that if this word is too heavy-handed, but it also has its own merits.
As we'll see in this documentary that this editorial later on becomes the center focus of the protest for a very long time.